17 to all of you. Welcome back to Corona Chemistry. And here we will be discussing and beginning the unit of bonding as it pertains to general chemistry. We'll also be discussing intermolecular forces and hybridization along with how to draw Lewis structures. Starting off with bonding, we first want to discuss the different types of bonds. And a lot of this unit is very, very visual. And so we're going to try to give you as much uh, pictures and images that we can utilize for analogies and metaphors for that sort of thing. Um, but aside from that, envisioning the molecules and the atoms working together is sort of a, a foreign concept to a lot of us when we're beginning this unit. So here we go. We're trying to uh, give you as much simple terminology as possible as it pertains to this. So in discussing our different types of bonding, there are three types that we're going to discuss, ionic, covalent, and metallic. And in knowing these three different types of bonding, we should know different characteristics, different properties of these. Well, in an ionic bond, just as we learned how to name them and form their formulas, an ionic bond is certainly between a metal and a nonmetal. Why? Well, they're a perfect match made in heaven. The metal wants to lose electrons in order to attain its full octet and behave like a noble gas. And the nonmetal typically wants to gain electrons, which would then give it a full octet and therefore make it behave like a noble gas. It's like it's a perfect match made in heaven. The metal wants to give, the nonmetal wants to receive. Well, most of these ionic compounds are crystalline solids at room temperature. You can imagine table salt, NaCl, sodium chloride. Uh, and the strength of these ionic bonds is calculated with a term known as lattice energy, which is simply the amount of energy that is released when one mole of this substance is ripped apart. Imagine that these bonds are storing potential energy between these atoms, right? And the moment that you sever these bonds, well, the energy has to go somewhere. And depending on how much energy is released, that tells you how stable a compound was. The more energy released, the more stable that compound was. Other properties about it, they have very high melting and boiling points. They are fairly brittle, meaning that you can shatter the larger solids with a hammer or something like that. Uh, and they can only conduct electricity in their molten state, not their solid state. So now, structure of ionic compounds and their crystal lattice. We just talked about a little bit about this lattice energy. Um, the more energy released, the more stable the compound, right? And when it is referring to one formula unit, that is simply the most simple ratio of cations to anions in order to make one molecule of this substance. We utilize the term molecule for covalent compounds. Well, we utilize the term formula unit for ionic compounds, right? One molecule of water is two hydrogens and one oxygen. Well, one formula unit of NaCl of salt is one sodium and one chlorine. One formula unit of magnesium fluoride is one magnesium in two fluorines as such, right? One formula unit of sodium phosphide is three sodium cations and one phosphorus anion. Well, how do we draw these uh, Lewis structures, if you want to call them that? Or how do we draw these ionic compounds? Well, we don't, we're not typically asked to draw them, but it still helps to know what is actually going on. And the ionic compound is actually going to be drawn in the aftermath stage. It's going to show and represent what occurs after these electrons are transferred. Remember, the metal is going to give, the nonmetal is going to receive, the cation is going to transfer electrons to the anion, right? It's very romantic, very romantic, the cation giving a part of himself. Well, if we look at the example of table salt, NaCl, we can see that sodium is going to give an electron and chlorine is going to receive an electron. Well, this first starts with the Lewis dot diagram as we learned how to draw in the last video with electron configuration and periodicity. Well, sodium only has one valence electron in its neutral state. And chlorine has seven valence electrons in its neutral state. So sodium wants to lose one in order to become uh, stable and have a full valence octet. And chlorine wants to gain one. And so they're perfect for each other. Sodium is going to transfer that electron to chlorine, right? So sodium losing electron becomes a positive charge, and chlorine gaining an electron obtains a negative charge. And we simply put brackets around these ions in order to represent that it is not neutral, and then we put the charge in the top right corner of these brackets. We are not typically asked to write these. It simply helps to understand uh, conceptually what is occurring here, the metal giving, the nonmetal receiving. Then as it stands for metallic bonding, right? If I have a block of gold, well, why does this work in the first place? Why do these atoms of gold, why are they content with sitting next to each other? Metals want to lose electrons typically. So if every atom in this block of gold wants to lose electrons, why are they okay with sitting next to each other? 
Well, it's because of this magic three words right here, this sea of electrons. And if you can imagine, all of these different atoms of gold, all their electron clouds are overlapping with one another, which creates this sea of electrons. The electrons can freely swim from C to C to C, from cloud to cloud to cloud. Uh, and what it does is it allows uh, different atoms to get rid of their burden at different times. So not everyone is dealing with all of their electrons at any given point. So essentially, they're taking turns being happy and dealing with the electrons. And all this is happening at an extremely rapid pace. Here's a very chemically accurate image right here. You can see that the positively charged nuclei here, and then all the blue dots are the electrons. Well, these electrons from this top left atom are able to freely swim around in this delocalized sea of electrons, and everyone is essentially able to take turns losing their electrons, when in the next moment they can then take the electrons back, uh, and they're essentially taking turns being happy, while other atoms uh, maybe aren't necessarily happy as it stands. The way that I like to think about this is a concept that maybe not all of you experience as a child. But when I was a kid, I had two younger brothers as well. And so having three kids in the house, it wasn't always the easiest thing for the parents to be able to go out on a date on the weekends. And so they joined what is called a babysitting co-op. And a babysitting co-op involves multiple couples with children. Look at all these beautiful families. And they all had babies, right? Wait a minute. That's Justin Bieber singing his hit song, Baby, not an actual baby. Ah, sorry for the mix-up there, ladies and gentlemen. But either way, these different couples are essentially going to take turns taking care of each other's children so that it frees up uh, their availability on a Friday or Saturday night so they can go dancing, they can hit the clubs, they can go to Chili's and get some skillet queso, whatever it is that floats their boat. And so what it is is maybe the couple – over here in the bottom left of your screen, maybe says, hey, hey, Nancy, Todd, send your kids over to my house this weekend. I'll take them on this weekend. You guys go have a, a, a hoot of a time. And then you guys just take my little, my little Johnny next weekend so that Clarissa and I can go out to eat. And so you just take turns rotating the burden of the children so that it frees up your availability to go and spend some significant time with your significant other. And that is the sea of electrons. How beautiful is that? Along with the sea of electrons, what this does is it allows the atoms, or sorry, the, these metals to be very malleable and ductile. And if you remember what that is, what those terms are, malleable is the property of being able to be hammered into flat sheets. And ductile, ductility, is the ability to be able to be stretched so thin that you become a wire. Uh, and then on top of that, with all of these electrons flowing around, they're very good conductors of electricity. And then, of course, as we know, with the metals involved in our jewelry and other substances, metals are very, very shiny. Very, very shiny. The last type of bonding that we will be discussing in this unit is covalent bonding, and it's going to bear the brunt of this unit. It's going to require the most to talk about because it has the most variability within it. And a covalent bond is between two different nonmetals. You might ask yourself, well, how do these two different nonmetals get together in the first place? Because nonmetals want to gain electrons. Well, if you've got two different atoms and they each want to gain electrons, how can you force them to be together? It's not like a fluorine can bump up into a chlorine in the middle of an alleyway and beat him up and steal his electrons because chlorine's going to fight for his electrons. He's not going to allow that to happen. Well, how it works is they form a partnership. A business transaction, if you will. They pool their resources together. They share their electrons. In fact, the word covalent means to share. And so we're going to learn how to draw these Lewis structures here very, very shortly. A line is used to represent the sharing of two electrons. And so what it's going to be is we're going to draw these two element symbols and draw a line between them in order to represent a relationship between them. But because they're because these atoms are not physically transferring the electrons like they were in the ionic compounds, it's not as strong of a partnership. So whereas ionic compounds had very high melting and boiling points, covalent compounds typically have low melting and boiling points. And the reason for that is because they're simply sharing electrons, not full-on investing their electrons and transferring them. Uh, the strength of their bond is dependent upon distance between the two atoms. You may have heard this in the past, 
but atoms can have single bonds between them, double bonds, or perhaps even triple bonds between them. And the more bonds you have, the shorter your bonds become, right? A triple bond is shorter than a single bond. They've got more electrons invested, and so they keep them a whole lot closer, right? If you're making an investment in a business, let's say you, you're devoting a vast majority of your current resources into a business, well, you're going to want to keep a close eye on it, right? You want to make sure that whoever you've put your faith and your trust in is doing the right thing with your cash dollars, your cash money, okay? And electro electronegativity is very, very, very important. It's a term that we utilize in the periodicity video, and it was one of the trends of the periodic table. Electronegativity is the ability to attract electrons. Well, atoms who are very, very attracted to electrons have a very big advantage at this current junction in chemistry. If you're attracted to electrons, well, you might be able to pull them a little bit closer to yourself than other atoms. And so some bonds involve the equal sharing of electrons between two atoms, but because of differences in personality of these elements, some are not equal sharing. But equal sharing is what is known as a nonpolar covalent bond, and we'll discuss polarity here pretty soon. Um, and this is mostly seen between our Brinkelhoff elements. Any atom attached to itself is going to be a nonpolar bond, right? If you're in a tug of war battle with yourself, who's going to win? Who's going to win? If it's an exact clone of yourself, should be a dead even tie. I don't know. Someone as strong as myself, and believe me, I'm crazy, I'm freakishly strong. Train my body to be a champion. And I couldn't beat myself. I couldn't beat myself in a million years. But I know I'm not going to let my clone beat me either. Not in a million years. No way. Uh, and then we'll discuss electronegativity here in a second. And so when calculating the electronegativity difference, this is going to help us determine whether or not a bond is polar or whether or not a bond is ionic. We simply have to look at these different number thresholds. And I have seen some discrepancy in certain sources. This is the one that I see the most commonly. If the electronegativity difference is less than 0.3, then it is a nonpolar covalent bond. If it is between 0.3 and 1.7, it is a polar covalent bond. And if it is a difference that is greater than 1.7, then it is what is called an ionic bond, aka a metal and a nonmetal. Very, very large difference. So the greater the difference, the more like an ionic bond it is, therefore the greater the difference, the greater the bond's ionic character. Well, where are we getting these numbers? We have to look at a different periodic table. We can't use the standard periodic table. This is one that is specific for electronegativity, and this is called the Linus Pauling scale. And so as you can see, every element has its own electronegativity value. This is how attractive the element is to electrons. And remember, remember, oh, fluorine! Fluorine's the highest, highest, the most beautiful, the most attractive, right? She walks through the door, jaws drop to the floor. I, I just... Once you've seen her, once you've experienced fluorine, it just it changes your world. We're getting off track here. Anyways, if we want to find the electronegativity difference, we simply take the larger electronegativity value and subtract the lower electronegativity value. For example, if we wanted to find out what type of bond nitrogen and carbon would form, we would simply take nitrogen's 3.0 and subtract carbon's 2.5, and that would be a difference that is between 0.3 and 1.7 because their difference would be 0.5. Therefore, the bond they would form is a polar covalent bond. And next, we will discuss what a nonpolar bond looks like and what a polar bond looks like. And then we will get into drawing these Lewis structures. Look forward to it. Now we are going to showcase three different types of bonds in regards to the differences in polarity. We're going to show you nonpolar, polar, and ionic bonds. Go Dallas Renegades. XFL, please come back for season two. That's my shout out to you. Anyways, we have the three different types of bonds, nonpolar, polar, and ionic. And a nonpolar bond is any bond between two atoms that have an electronegativity difference of less than 0.3. Usually what this means is it is two identical atoms getting together. Well, just imagine if you were in a tug of war battle with yourself like so, Well, 
then no one is going to win. If you are in a battle with an exact clone of yourself, no one can win. You cannot beat yourself. It's a tie, of course. And so their electronegativity difference would be zero. For example, in a molecule of hydrogen gas, which would be H2, two hydrogen atoms getting together, the difference between them would be zero. Now, what does that mean? Well, when these two atoms get together, and I know we haven't started drawing these Lewis structures yet, but when these atoms get together and they form a bond, like so, two hydrogen atoms sharing their electrons on this line right here, well, that means that they share them equally. A nonpolar bond means that these two atoms share it equally. Not the case when we look at our polar bonds. Next, we will do an example of a polar bond, which would be between hydrogen and nitrogen, for example, on our board here. And where are we getting these numbers, these electronegativity values? Well, we are simply pulling from that electronegativity periodic table using the Linus Pauling scale that you could see on the slides and also in the top part of the screen. Nitrogen has an electronegativity value of 3.0, and hydrogen has an electronegativity value of 2.1. And so, if we simply take the larger value, 3.0, and subtract 2.1, that is a difference of 0.9, which puts us into that middle category. Because the difference between these two atoms falls between 0.3 and 1.7, that means that this is a polar bond. Well, what does that mean? Well, think of the word polar. Right? We hear the word pole within, and where do we see that word pole? Well, think about magnets. North pole and south pole of the magnets. Right? Opposites attract. Well, what does this mean in regards to the electrons and where they are positioned in these bonds? Once again, we haven't drawn Lewis structures yet, but we use lines to represent these bonds. And if nitrogen is going to form a bond with hydrogen, it would look like so. But nitrogen has a much higher electronegativity than hydrogen. And remember what the definition of electronegativity is. Electronegativity is the ability to attract electrons. So what this means is that nitrogen is much more attractive for these electrons than hydrogen is. Have you ever had a, a best friend who had just the, the coolest house, right? And during summer vacation, y your mom has to call you every few days and be like, Sweetie, please come home. We, we miss you. Sarah's house is great, but please, we'll, we'll make your favorite meal. We'll make vegetable lasagna, whatever it takes to bring you home. And so you go home to appease your mom. But the moment that you can go back over to Sarah's house because she's she's got three hot tubs upstairs. She's got an ice cream sundae bar, right? A PS4 for each of you, right? You don't even have to share the same one in split screen. You get your own PS4 while you're over there. It's just an awesome house. Right? And you want to spend every waking moment there. Well, that's the case for the electrons as well. And so there are two electrons on this line right here, and yet they want to spend a greater portion of their time at the more electronegative elements house, which in this case is nitrogen. And because the electrons are spending a greater portion of time over there, well, that means nitrogen is going to get... Not a full, but this symbol right here stands for partial. It's going to get a partial negative charge because nitrogen not completely has absorbed these electrons, but for a greater portion of the time has more electrons than he normally has. And remember, when we gain electrons, we get a negative charge. Well, if he has a partial negative charge, then what must hydrogen have over here? Well, he must certainly have a partial positive charge. And this is where we get that name polar versus nonpolar. These are the poles that they are referring to, right? The element that is more electronegative has a greater pull on these electrons and therefore obtains a partial negative charge. Lastly, we're going to look at the electronegativity difference between an ionic bond, which has a electronegativity difference that is greater than 1.7. And it should be a dead giveaway whenever we look at the elements uh, themselves. We shouldn't have to even look at their electronegativities. But the example that we're going to use here today is between sodium and chlorine. And if we wanted to look at their electronegativity difference, 
Chlorine has an electronegativity of 3.0, and sodium has an electronegativity difference of 0.9. Which, of course, comes out to an electronegativity difference of 2.1, which is certainly larger than 1.7, which means it's an ionic bond. But that should come as no surprise to us, because an ionic bond always involves a metal and a non-metal. And so the fact that we were utilizing sodium, a metal, and chlorine, a non-metal, it should have already been fairly obvious to us that this is an ionic bond. The greater the difference in electric electronegativity, the more like an ionic bond, the greater the ionic character of the bond. With this next part of the video, we're going to learn how to draw Lewis structures, otherwise known as Lewis dot structures of covalent compounds, which is the bonds between different non-metal elements on the periodic table. And one of the most important pieces of information that we need is how many valence electrons are these elements bringing to the table whenever they get into a bond, whenever they get into a compound with another element. And there's a very quick shortcut. You could draw the full electron configuration for all of these elements. There's no need, though, as with covalent compounds, we are dealing with all nonmetals. So we're really looking to the right side of this periodic table over here. And the shortcut is for all the A block elements, otherwise known as the representative elements, there's eight families, eight A block representative families. And whatever number is in front of that letter A, 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, that's how many valence electrons are bringing to the table. So note these numbers up here at the top, right? Carbon has four dots, four valence electrons. Phosphorus has five dots, five valence electrons. Selenium has six dots, six valence electrons. And then all of our halogens all have seven valence electrons. And then our noble gases, not sure why it doesn't say eight here, but they bring eight to the table when they very, very rarely get into compounds, but we will see that. So what we're first going to do before we pan over to the next screen is we're going to draw a few of our diatomic elements in molecular structures. These are going to be three examples of nonpolar compounds, but the bottom line that we want to get across here and the key to drawing these Lewis structures is all atoms typically want eight valence electrons. Our main exception to that is hydrogen who's happy with two valence electrons. He only has one proton in his nucleus, so he only has the strength to really hold two electrons. Um, but aside from that, virtually every other element that we're going to be considering in these compounds wants eight valence electrons. There are more exceptions beyond hydrogen that are happy with less or are happy with more, but we will get to that. The cardinal rule that you want to hold on to right now is that all of these elements want eight valence electrons. Okay, so we're going to draw three diatomic molecules from our Brinkelhoff elements, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And you're going to see that they each look a little different in their molecular structure. But just as we said in the previous clip, we want to make sure that we know how many valence electrons these elements are bringing to the table. We want to make sure that all of our electrons are represented. We also want to make sure that we're not starting with more electrons than the elements actually have to offer, right? You can't spend money that you don't actually have. And so starting with H2, hydrogen is element number one on the periodic table and only has one valence electron to bring, okay? And so we're going to start by drawing the Lewis dot structure for each of those hydrogens. Well, as we said in the last clip as well, most of these elements want eight valence electrons, but hydrogen is our main exception to that. Hydrogen only wants two. Well, and looky here, there's actually two total elements between these two hydrogen molecules. And what they realize is if they form a partnership and hold hands, that they can both be happy simultaneously, right? They can share the wealth. And so instead of drawing these dots here, how we represent that is with a line. And that line is a bond. And the bond is essentially them holding hands. And in every single line that you draw in these molecules, it represents two electrons. Every line represents two electrons. And so we don't need, we don't need these dots in the image. All we have to draw are our two H's in our line, like so. Okay. Moving on to oxygen gas. If you look at where oxygen is located on the periodic table, he brings six electrons. And there's two of them. And so we've drawn the Lewis dot structures for each of these oxygen atoms. And look, they line up perfectly with one another. Now, oxygen is not hydrogen. Therefore, oxygen is going to shoot for having eight valence electrons. 
If they have six, well, they want to gain two, which means oxygen typically wants to form two bonds. Well, looky here. How we've drawn these dots, we can see that there's two perfect junctions for these bonds to form. First bond takes place between these two middle electrons, and the second bond is going to take place between these lower electrons. Did you have to draw these dots down below? Absolutely not. That's just how we conveniently place them here. It doesn't matter where your bonds are actually located in reference to your atoms here. And so this is a lot of dots there, but instead we're going to clean it up a little bit. And so that is the cleaned up drawing for the oxygen molecule, right? Your dots do not necessarily have to be here, but as we're going to learn a little bit later with how these molecules are actually shaped, the electrons are going to get as far apart from each other as possible. And that's because all of your electrons are negatively charged and therefore repel one another. So next we're going to look at nitrogen. And some of you doing the math in your head can probably already realize what's going to occur here. But nitrogen, where it's located on the periodic table in column 5A, only has five electrons to bring to the table. And so we've got our nitrogen atoms set up. Well, if nitrogen has five and he wants to get to eight, well, that means he wants to form three bonds. And so how we've drawn these atoms right here, we can see that nitrogen has very convenient locations for each of these bonds between the electrons that we have drawn here. Okay, And so nitrogen is actually forming a triple bond. And so if we clean that up a little bit, there are three lines between the two nitrogen symbols, like so. Now, the follow-up question in your notes is who has the longest bond, who has the strongest bond, who has the shortest bond, so on and so forth, right? Obviously, if we put more bonds between two atoms, that's more electrons invested, therefore it is a stronger bond. And the stronger your bond is, the closer, the tighter they can hold their bonding partner together. So therefore, the more bonds you have, the shorter your entire bond actually is. So nitrogen with its triple bond is the strongest bond. It is also the shortest bond. And hydrogen only having a single bond is actually the longest bond. So let me step away here for a second so you can get the whole overall image. And that is drawing Brinkelhoff molecules. Quarantine log. Day 53. I'm beginning to worry a lot about all the guys who are going to be forced to wear man buns soon enough. And all the guys who are going to think that they look good. Will I have to? I can't cut my hair without sports clips. These rules right above my head are your go-to steps on how to draw these Lewis structures for the covalent compounds. And you can rinse and repeat these for each and every single one of your covalent compounds, right? You just go down the list, and if something doesn't apply to you, well, then you don't use it. Um, but really, this is one of those where we're going to constantly draw upon it, but it also helps to really see an example done for you. And so we're going to do the following examples in your notes. We're going to look at several different molecules, CH4, H2O, CO2, C2H4, ASF3, and SO3, okay? We'll go through step-by-step step utilizing these rules. If you want to take a shot of this one right here, or if you're following along in the notes that are in the link down below the video, well, then you are going to see them front and center, but we'll also keep them to the side of the screen whenever we're actually doing these examples. Next, we'll be drawing the six different molecules that you can find in your notes, starting with CH4. And I'll be going through step by step with all of the steps that you saw in the previous clip, uh, referencing them and seeing the line of thinking that you want to approach when drawing any of these structures. So we're starting with CH4. And the first step in any time you are drawing one of these structures is to count up how many electrons you actually have. Right? You want to make sure that all of your electrons are represented, and you certainly don't want to have more than are actually present. Right, And so we have to reference where each of these elements are located on the periodic table. Carbon is in family 4A, and therefore has four valence electrons. 
Hydrogen is in family 1A and therefore only has one valence electron. However, there are four of them. So we're going to take that one and multiply by four. And we're gonna add that all up and we have eight total electrons, which means when we are done drawing our structure, we will have eight electrons represented. The next step says to put your cent or to figure out who your central atom is. And your central atom is whoever your least electronegative element is, unless it's hydrogen. Hydrogen can never be the central atom because he only wants one bond. He only wants two electrons. Carbon, pretty much rule of thumb is, if you ever have carbon, carbon's gonna be in the middle. And the reason why is carbon wants four bonds, which makes him a perfect central atom. So, rule of thumb, hydrogen can never be in the center, and carbon pretty much always is in the center. So carbon's gonna go in the middle, and another rule of thumb here is whatever element you have one of, I've got four hydrogens, I've got one carbon, whatever element you have one of is most likely gonna go in the middle. So carbon's gonna go in the middle, four hydrogens on the outside. Now we know that they are bonded in some way, shape, or form. Otherwise, why would we be here? We know that they're bonded together. This unit is called bonding. So of course, there's at least a single bond between each of these elements. So I'm gonna go ahead and take that. I'm gonna go ahead and take care of that. I'm gonna put a single bond between the central atom and all of the peripheral atoms, the atoms on the outside. But remember, how many electrons are in every line? Well, a line means two electrons. And so I need to count up how many did I just use? Two, four, six, eight. I drew four lines that each represent two electrons. Therefore, I just used eight electrons. And so if you're tracking your electron total, which I would highly encourage you to do until you get really, really good at this, I've used all my electrons. Now I just need to make sure that everyone is happy. When everyone is happy, I am done and I did it correctly. My hydrogens only want two electrons. So if they've got a line coming out of them, they're good to go. Carbon wants to have eight electrons. Remember, he only started with four, but how many does he have now? Well, he's got four lines coming out of him and each line represents two electrons. Four times two, carbon has eight electrons and is happy. Next, we are drawing water, H2O. And as your first step was in the last problem, it's the same for every single one of your problems. First step is to count up how many electrons you have. I've got two hydrogens and one oxygen. I need to look at where they are located on the periodic table. Each hydrogen only has one valence electron, but there's two of them. So two times one. And oxygen is located in family 6A. Therefore, he is bringing six to the table. So although it's a different molecule, it still has the same amount of valence electrons as our last molecule did, we have eight. Next is to identify who your central atom is. Remember we said that hydrogen can never be in the middle and typically whatever you have one of is going to be in the middle. So oxygen is gonna be our central atom here. So oxygen is gonna go in the middle and I know there's at least a single atom attaching all of these atoms together. So I might as well get that out of the way. And so we're going to go ahead and do that. If you're a big Star Wars fan like myself, you're starting to see that it kind of looks like a TIE fighter, right? And that just, that rustles my jimmies the right way. And so now we've drawn two lines. How many electrons have we used? Well, each line represents two electrons. Two times two is four. I've got four leftover electrons. If you're following the steps that we gave you in the last couple of clips, the next step says to make your outside or your peripheral atoms happy by adding electrons to them. However, hydrogen only wants two electrons. It wants a line coming out of it. That's it. Therefore, they're good to go. Then on the rules, it says if you have leftover electrons after making your outside guys happy, they always go to the central atom in pairs. So I've got four electrons, which is going to make two pairs. One pair, two pairs. I drew four dots, therefore I used four electrons. I've got none left over. Last is just to make sure that everyone is happy. My hydrogens only want two, they only want a line coming out of them. Oxygen wants eight. Well, he's got four dots, one, two, three, four. 
and he has two lines, five, six, seven, eight. So oxygen has his eight electrons and oxygen is good to go. Next in your notes is carbon dioxide. First step, count up how many electrons we have. Carbon is gonna give me four, as he is located in family 4A on the periodic table. And I've got two oxygens that each give me six, as they are located in family 6A on the periodic table. So two times six. So a little bit of Big Shack quick maths here, four plus 12, and we've got 16 valence electrons to work with. These three elements, these three atoms, are going to utilize these 16 valence electrons in order to make everyone happy. Next step, identify who goes in the center. Pretty much, if you've got carbon, he's gonna go in the middle. Otherwise, just pay attention to who you've got one copy of. I only have one copy of carbon, therefore carbon is going in the middle. And I know there's at least a single bond between each of the atoms, therefore I'm gonna knock that out. We can add more later if that's necessary, but we might as well get the minimum out of the way just to know how many electrons we have left over. So I used two lines to connect them all. That means I used four electrons. So I've got 12 electrons left. The next step on your set of rules says to add electrons to the outside atoms in order to make them happy. This is the first time we've had something that wasn't hydrogen on the outside. So this is the first time we've actually had to do this. And each oxygen currently only has two electrons, but they want to get to eight. Therefore, each of them actually need six more electrons. So we're going to add six dots to each. And typically, you want to add these dots in pairs. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Like so. Well, I just added six electrons to two oxygens. Six times two is 12. I've got no leftover electrons. I've used them all. So am I good to go? Well, you have to double check to see that everyone is happy. My oxygens are good. They each have eight electrons. But my carbon only has one, two, three, four electrons. That's a no-go. We're not going to get into this relationship unless it makes everyone happy. And so the very last step on your rules is if you have utilized all of your electrons and your central atom is not happy, seek to make additional bonds, which means now we can borrow electrons from our outside, our peripheral atoms, and make double or perhaps even triple bonds if necessary in order to make every atom happy here. And so what you're seeing here is that each oxygen has the same amount of electrons to donate potentially. And so typically what molecules do is they make it even on both sides. And so what these oxygens realize is they go, eh, we could give a couple more in order to make everyone happy. So this oxygen is going to donate a couple of electrons. And now there's a double bond here. And then this oxygen thinks the exact same thing. It could donate those two electrons and make a double bond there. You might be saying, well, why didn't you just do a triple bond on one side? You could do that. Um, another topic that we can have in the future is concerning formal charge. Typically, molecules have a very symmetrical appearance if possible, but we can save that discussion for later. Either way, double check yourself. Everyone's happy. All the oxygens have eight electrons and carbon also has eight electrons. Next is C2H4, which is one of the only organic molecules that we'll have you draw in this video. Um, and I just wanted to show you that sometimes you can actually have more than one central atom. And so what's going to happen, since hydrogen can never be our central atom, the carbons sort of share the load. They're both in the middle. But first step, as always, count up your electrons. I've got two carbons that each give me four, and I've got four hydrogens that each give me one. So I've got four times two plus one times four. So eight plus four, I have 12 valence electrons to work with. So both of my carbons are in the middle and we know there's at least a single bond attaching everything together. So let's start to lay the framework. And this takes a little bit of practice, um, but it's very intuitive once you start to draw these organic molecules. Both my carbons sharing the middle. And it's not as if they're gonna put three hydrogens on one side and one on the other. As we just said in the last clip, we wanna stay symmetrical if possible. 
So these hydrogens are going to split up two to one carbon, two to the other. And there's at least a single bond between all of them, so we go ahead and draw those in. And boom, we have all of our bonds drawn. How many electrons did we just use? Well, this is more lines we've drawn in our previous examples. One, two, three, four, five lines drawn, each with two electrons used in each of those bonds. Therefore, we utilized 10 electrons. So I've got two left over. The next step would normally be to make the outside atoms happy, but our outside atoms are hydrogen. Therefore, they only want two valence electrons. Therefore, we're not going to add any more to them. And so, where are these two bonus electrons going to go? Well, look at the atoms that aren't happy. And those are your central atoms. Currently, each carbon only has six valence electrons with three lines attached to them. And so what are we going to do? We're going to make both of them happy with the same two electrons by adding a double bond here. And that's C2H4. Utilizing the last bit of our electrons, double check to make sure that everyone is happy, and you're good to go. Next, we have arsenic trifluoride. First step, as always, draw out how many electrons you have. Add them up. Arsenic is in family 5A, and therefore is going to provide five valence electrons. And I've got three fluorines that each provide seven electrons based on their location on the periodic table. And so that's a grand total of 26 electrons, more electrons than we've had on any of our examples we've done previously. As always, identify who your central atom is going to be. It is your least electronegative atom, or typically whatever you have one of, therefore arsenic's going to go in the middle. And there's at least a single bond between each of these atoms, so we're going to go ahead and knock that out of the way. By drawing three lines, two electrons apiece, we've just utilized six electrons. I have 20 left over. And your next step is to make the outside guys happy. We always make the outside happy and then the inside. Well, each of these fluorines currently only have two electrons. They brought seven to the table. They want eight, but they currently only have two, which means each fluorine is going to need an additional six electrons. So let's go ahead and add those. Six dots onto each of your fluorines. You get pretty fast with drawing these dots here with a little bit of practice. So six times three, quick maths, we just utilized 18, but we have two left over. And if you're following your rules once again, after you've made your outside guys happy, if you have any leftover electrons, they always go to the central atom in pairs. With two electrons left over, we have enough to give one pair to the central atom. So now all of our electrons have been utilized, and if you double check your work, everyone is now happy. All of your fluorines have six dots in one line, a grand total of eight valence electrons, and your arsenic has three lines and one pair of electrons. And these are called lone pairs. The pairs of electrons located around your atom are called lone pairs, electrons that are sort of existing on their own. Um, and most of the time, we focus in on the lone pairs that are on the central atom. Either way, that is ASF3. And our last example in this batch of problems is SO3, sulfur trioxide. First step, count up your electrons. All of these elements, all of these atoms, all come from the same family on the periodic table. Sulfur brings six valence electrons to the table, and each oxygen is going to bring six as well. And so the math here, six from sulfur and six from each of my three oxygens, bringing a grand total of 24 electrons. Identify your central atom, whatever you have one copy of, sulfur. Sulfur goes to the middle, and there's at least a single bond between all of them, so we go ahead and knock that out. Two electrons for each bond. We just drew three lines, therefore we utilized six electrons. Next step, we're just going down the rules here, is to make our outside guys happy. They currently only have two electrons. They want to get to eight, therefore they each need six more. Add your dots. And 
and 6 times 3 is 18. So we've utilized all of our electrons. However, take a closer look, your central atom is not happy. And so if you're going down the list of the rules, what, do we, what are we running into here? Well, if you utilize all of your electrons and your central atom is still not happy, we seek to make additional bonds. But now the question is, who do we make the bond with? These are all the same atom on the outside. So who is the unlucky winner to give up two extra electrons? Does it actually matter? And the answer is no, it does not matter. You could pick any of these options and you are exactly right, which means there's actually three different ways that this structure could be drawn. S uh, with a double bond to the left one, S with a double bond to the bottom one, or S with a double bond to the right one. However you're drawing it, it doesn't matter. There's three different ways you could draw this. And this is our first example of what is known as resonance. In the previous clip, we just drew sulfur trioxide. We mentioned this very special word, resonance. Bonding between atoms that cannot be represented by one Lewis structure. In the final step, you realize that Sulfur is not happy. He hasn't gotten his full octet. He doesn't have eight electrons. And so he's looking to make one final bond. So he's going to need to make a double bond with oxygen. And it doesn't actually matter which one you choose. You can choose the top oxygen, the left oxygen, or right oxygen. It does not matter. And so what this means is that there's three different ways we can draw this because in actuality what is really occurring if you look at the actual electrons and they do have machines that do this with electron microscopes you can actually see that these oxygens sort of form this agreement with one another hey I, I shouldn't be the only one that has to invest more than you guys and form this double bond with him let's take turns doing this and so what actually happens is the electrons rotate around Sort of like the blades on a helicopter just spinning around and around and around. And so at any given moment, it could be this oxygen that has a double bond. It could be this oxygen that has a double bond. It could be this oxygen that has a double bond. And so we exhibit resonance here, and we actually see the double bond transferring, rotating around the molecule. The next term that we can look at with these uh, drawings here, and actually, sorry, First thing we want to look at is another example. If you draw carbonate, CO3 2 minus, you're going to see that it's going to exhibit a very, very similar circumstance. It's going to exhibit that same resonance that we just saw with SO3. The only thing you have to watch out for is this 2 minus charge, and that is going to force you to count those extra two electrons whenever you're initially counting your valence electrons. Remember, if you have a positive charge, you have lost electrons. If you have a negative charge, you have gained electrons. So here, carbonate, the polyatomic ion, it has gained two electrons that weren't there originally. Next, we're going to draw the polyatomic ion carbonate, and it's the exact same steps. It's going to be another example of a molecule that exhibits resonance uh, in its final structure, but it really is just going to ask for us to pay extra attention to detail because of this negative charge. We haven't drawn ions prior in this video. First step, as always, count up your total number of valence electrons. Carbon, based on its location on the periodic table, is going to provide four valence electrons, and each of my oxygens are going to provide six valence electrons. However, this negative two charge means that this molecule has taken on two extra electrons that would not normally be there if it was neutral. We have to add those two electrons to our total count. Four from carbon and a total of 18 from my oxygens, and then that two from that negative two charge. You have to sort of flip your thinking. Remember, when you gain electrons because they have a negative charge, you will gain a negative charge as well. So we actually add two electrons here, we don't subtract two. So four plus 18 is 22, plus two is 24. If we did not add those electrons, we would run into issues with our final structure here shortly. As always, our element that we just have one of is going to go to the middle. If you ever have carbon, carbon is going to go in the middle. And we know there's at least a single bond between all of these, so we go ahead and join them. And on each line, we just utilized two electrons. So we're going to subtract two, four, six electrons from our total. So I've got 18 left over. Next step is to make all of my outer atoms, my peripheral atoms, happy. Oxygen wants to get to eight. So they currently only have two with this line. So we're going to add six dots onto each of our oxygens. Six 
Six dots on three different auctions, six times three, big shack, quick mass. We just used 18. So we have no electrons left over, but we have to take a double check at our structure, and we see that carbon, our central atom, is not happy. He's gonna need two extra electrons. Well, where is he gonna get it from? It doesn't actually matter which oxygen you choose. And so this is another example, just like in our previous example, SO3. Uh, this is gonna be another one that exhibits resonance. It doesn't matter if you choose the left oxygen, the bottom oxygen, or the right oxygen, you can choose any of them. And so a couple of different answers uh, to a couple of questions that you could have would be how many resonance structures does this molecule exhibit? How many resonance structures does it have? Well, there's three different ways you could draw this, right? Therefore, it has three different resonance structures. So, let's just pick a random option. It doesn't matter which one we do. And it exhibits that double bond right there. That's CO3, two minus carbonate. Next, we're gonna look at another special type of bond, and this is called a coordinate covalent bond. This is a very rare circumstance, but does happen in a few examples. And this is the main example we're gonna look at, carbon monoxide. A coordinate covalent bond is where one atom contributes both of the electrons for a bond. Well, typically when atoms are getting together, and remember each line represents two electrons, but typically when these atoms get together, it's one electron from one atom and one electron from the other atom. But here in this very special circumstance, these two atoms want to get together, they want to make the relationship work, yet one doesn't have all of the resources that they need in order to put their equal share into the relationship. And so the other atom has to volunteer to put in a little more oomph into this relationship in order to make it work. Remember, they're not going to get together unless everyone is happy. And this coordinate covalent bond in a carbon monoxide is very hard to see unless you're actually drawing out the Lewis structure. So that's what we're gonna look at now. Next, we're going to be showing you how carbon monoxide is an example of a coordinate covalent bond, where one of the atoms in a bond is contributing both of the electrons for one of those bonds. And we're not gonna follow the exact same steps because that doesn't necessarily showcase how one of the atoms is contributing both the electrons. We're actually gonna start with the Lewis dot structures of each of these elements, which is something that we did towards the beginning of this video when we were drawing those diatomic Brinkelhoff gases. So carbon has four valence electrons. So it gets a dot on each side like so. And oxygen has six valence electrons. Oops. Like so, all right? And actually, I know this kind of goes against the logic here, but this is going to, we, we, we went to see the final product of carbon monoxide. If we were to follow the original steps for drawing this molecule, this is what it would end up looking like. A triple bond between carbon and oxygen, and each atom has a lone pair on it. Well, how do we actually get there from this Lewis dot structure formula? Well, let's try to find the bonds here. I see that there's a bond right here, and I see that there's a really good opportunity for a bond right here. So that's two of the bonds. However, looking at the final product, each of my atoms has a lone pair on the atom, which means these two electrons have to stay exactly where they are. They're not going to be involved in a bond. So where is this triple bond going to come from? Well, we can imagine that these two, uh, these two electrons right here are the lone pair for the oxygen, which means these two electrons right here must form the third bond. So as we've drawn it this way, we see that these two electrons right here, which were both property of oxygen, are being contributed for this final and triple bond between carbon and oxygen. Therefore, this is an example of a coordinate covalent bond. Quarantine log, day 54. I thought about getting a large cat for protection. I considered lions and cougars and tigers. Surprisingly, the tiger didn't seem too difficult to obtain. It said something about a recent owner being killed by some, I, I don't know. Something about Carol Baskins? I, What's the joke here? <laughs> Tigers. So when we were first drawing the Lewis structures, we mentioned that hydrogen is our main example of an atom that doesn't necessarily want eight valence electrons when everything is all said and done. 
Well, hydrogen only wants the two. And there are a couple of other exceptions that are okay with having less than eight. However, there are multiple exceptions for those that are okay with taking on more than eight. And we're going to draw a few of those uh, in the next video here. Um, but either way, the, the steps that you take are the exact same. You're still going to follow the exact same steps, and it's going to lead you to the correct answer. But what actually qualifies for an atom? What allows an atom to take on more than eight valence electrons? Well, let's take a look at the periodic table, and let's relate it back to the electron configuration that we learned about in the previous unit. In electron configuration, we learned about the S sublevels, the P sublevels, the D sublevels, and the F sublevels. Well, to be able to take on more than eight valence electrons, you have to have the real estate to put them somewhere. And if you're counting up the available uh, electron space that you have in the S and P sublevels, you only get eight spots. The S sublevel can hold two electrons, and the P sublevel can hold six electrons. So how can we fit more than eight? Well, that means you have to have available a D sublevel, at least. And so the only atoms, the only elements that we're going to see that can possibly take on more than eight valence electrons, well, they have to be on at least the third row of the periodic table. We don't get a D sublevel in the electron configuration of elements until we get to the third energy level, the third ring of electrons. Therefore, these elements right here, let's just start with phosphorus. Phosphorus, for example, doesn't necessarily use his D sublevel of electrons, but he does have three rings of electrons. So he doesn't have electrons in the D sublevel. However, the real estate is there. Therefore, he can slide electrons into that D sublevel, therefore allowing him to have access to or allowing him to have more than those eight valence electrons than he typically would. So now let's practice drawing some of these structures here. PCL5, SF6, XEF4, xenon tetrafluoride. You will find these examples in your notes. With final drawings of this video, we're going to be showing you some examples of central atoms that can have an expanded octet. Therefore, they have more than eight valence electrons when everything is all said and done. We're beginning with PCL5, phosphorus pentachloride. Well, looking at it, we can tell that phosphorus is going to go in the middle because I only have one copy of that. It is also the lesser of electronegativity values between these two atoms. But first, we're going to add up all of our electrons. Phosphorus is going to give me five. And each of my five chlorines are going to give me seven. So I add that all up and I get 40, which is more than we've utilized in our drawings in the past. No problemo, doesn't actually change anything here. Phosphorus is going to go in the middle and I know there's at least a single bond between phosphorus and all of the outer elements. So we're going to go ahead and connect those. It doesn't matter what the positioning is on these chlorines. Draw it however you'd like. Like so, we've got phosphorus and five chlorines attached. Well, I just drew five lines. Each line represents two electrons, therefore two times five. I just utilized 10 of my 40 remaining, so I've got 30 left over. Next step is to make sure that your outer guys are happy. Well, chlorine wants to get to eight valence electrons. It only has two right now. Therefore, would they each need six more dots on them? Add those dots. One, two, three, four, five, six. 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 Six times five, quick maths. We just used 30. None left over. Last step is just to make sure that everyone is happy. All of your chlorines have eight valence electron and your phosphorus actually has 10. So he definitely has his eight valence that he's going for. So we can think of this guy as being more than happy. He got more than he was actually in it for, and that's okay. So everyone is happy. They've got at least their eight valence electrons that they wanted, and we're good to go. We utilized all of our electrons. Next up is drawing sulfur hexafluoride, the gas that makes your voice super, super deep, the opposite of helium, because of how big this gas is. And we're going to draw it, and you're going to see that it looks kind of large on paper as well. First step, as always, count up all of your electrons. Sulfur gives me six. And each of my six fluorines provides seven. Add that all up, and we get 48 total electrons. Once again, a record-breaking total. Sulfur is going to go in the middle because I only have one copy of it. And we're going to try to divvy up these fluorines however we see fit. Remember how you are to, 
two-dimensionally drawing these on the page is not how they actually look three-dimensionally, but it gives you a good idea on where the electrons are positioned. We will talk about how they actually look three-dimensionally in the next video, and that's something called Vesper. So now we've drawn six lines, a line to each of the fluorines. So six times two, we've utilized 12 of our 48 electrons. So subtract 12, I've got 36 left over. Next step is to make our outside guys happy. They each want to get to eight. They currently only have two. So we're going to add six more dots to each of them. All right, we just added six dots to six fluorines. Six times six is 36. So I've got no electrons left over. Last step is to make sure that everyone is happy. All of my fluorines have eight and sulfur actually has 12. Six lines attached to them, two electrons apiece. Sulfur has an expanded octet and we're good to go. In our last example for the day, XEF4 is very unique in that xenon is a noble gas and noble gases are almost completely inert. They don't wanna react. And so this is a very rare occasion for this to occur. And the reason why xenon is one of the few candidates for this is because xenon is so large, right? It's got these very, very large electron clouds. And so you could sneak a reaction in theoretically if you got the electrons out far enough. So that's what's occurring here. It'd be very hard to sneakily influence helium into bonding with something when helium is such a small, small, tight nucleus. Everyone knows each other in such a close proximity to one another. But either way, we're gonna follow the exact same steps. We're gonna count up all of our electrons. Xenon from the noble gas family actually already has a full octet, so he's bringing eight. And four fluorines are halogens that each give me seven. So we've got eight plus 28 here, so that's a total of 36 electrons. And we know that xenon's gonna be in the middle, and there's at least a single bond between all of these, so we go ahead and knock that out, like so. We drew four lines, therefore we used eight electrons. So we're back to having 28 electrons. Next step is to make our outside guys happy. We always make the outside happy, then the inside. And so we're gonna add six electrons to each of our fluorines. Six times four, do the maths here. We utilize 24 electrons and we have four left over. If you're following the step-by-step -step rules that you see up at the top of your screen or that you're following along in your notes, well, we know that if we ever have leftover electrons after making our outside guys happy, then all that we have to do is put them on the central atom in pairs. With four electrons, I have enough to make two pairs. One, two, three, four. There we go. And so now after doing that, Oops, that's not how we write that. We have now utilized all of our electrons. So we've double checked to make sure that everyone has at least their eight valence electrons that they're going for, and we're good to go. Thanks for watching. Join us next time where we cover Vesper and intramolecular forces.